Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to everyone in the hall, and welcome to uh, the members of my uh, panel. Um, I will get cracking straight away because we're starting uh, a little bit late. So this panel will be looking at uh, prosperity and resilience in uh, coastal communities, uh, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the threat of climate change. Uh, it's a very pertinent issue, uh, given that this week both Bangladesh and India have been grappling with the threat of uh, Cyclone Bulbul. Uh, two million people evacuated. Uh, sadly, uh, across India and Bangladesh, uh, maybe over 30 people lost their lives. Um, uh, my first experience of dealing with climate resilience in uh, this region was in Myanmar, uh, which was dealing with the aftermath of Cyclone Nargis in 2008, where 140,000 people at least lost their lives. So we were talking in the panel just before coming in here, the huge progress that's been made in the region in terms of predicting cyclones and responding effectively to them and building resilience in communities. Uh, I don't know whether I'm the best or the worst kind of moderator for a session like this, because I don't actually know anything about coastal communities, uh, other than I grew up in one, uh, in a place called Cornwall, uh, in, the south, uh, in the southwest of uh, England, uh, a place that's famous for its wet and wild beauty, uh, and in its own way, actually, is, is, is starting to tackle the issue of climate change in that part of the world, heavier rainfall, more flooding, more extreme weather events. Um, but we'll... Uh, it'd be interesting to see whether there's any kind of crossover between that part of the world and this one. So my first um, question, I'm going to ask the same question of all, all, all the panel members, is thinking about resilience and prosperity in coastal communities in the Indo-Pacific, uh, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future and why? And I'll start with J.M. Mauska at the end, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Oliver. I'm optimistic. And I'll tell you why. You must have seen in the newspapers and media, they talk about war against climate change. Am I audible? You might need to move the mic a bit closer, yeah. sorry. Uh, shall I start again? Yeah. Uh, I am optimist and I'll tell you why. In the popular discourse now, people are talking about war against climate change. And it's a historical fact that war or danger concentrates mind, whether it is cold war or it is active war, the technological innovations, the scientific discoveries, the periods of progress, it is unfortunate but true, have coincided with when we are surrounded by danger. And I'm sure that like we had uh, what radio transistors, nuclear power, everything, if you can think of 30 years ago, what was not here, has come through the Cold War. So this climate change war also, with cooperation and with concentration of mind, we are going to win. Thank you. I think that's the first time uh, someone's told me that war makes them optimistic. Uh, but in this case, it will hopefully be the driver of invention and change and uh, evolution. Interesting. Natalie, can I ask you the same question? Thank you very much, Ollie, and thank you to uh, Orf and, and Biz for arranging uh, su such a fantastic event over the last few days. Um, in, in summary, I think I, I agree with Dr. Mauska. I think there's no question that coastal communities uh, around the world, and particularly in the Indo-Pacific, face very severe challenges, um, many of them as a result of, the, uh, of dangerous climate change. Um, but, but I think there are reasons for optimism. I think, first of all, the first reason for optimism are the actions which are being taken in the countries in the region uh, to, to tackle the, these challenges and, and to respond so effectively to natural disasters. Ollie's already mentioned um, the incredible early warning systems which are now in place uh, to, to tackle cyclones in the region, for example. Um, but I think the second reason for optimism is that we're starting to see countries in the region and globally come together to share some of that knowledge and experience of, of tackling these disasters and to therefore become kind of stronger as a whole, in particular 
at, in September at the UN Climate Action Summit, Prime Minister Modi launched a, a, the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, which will do exactly this, bringing countries together around the world to, to share, share this experience and knowledge. And the UK is proud to be a fem, founder member of that coalition. And um, thirdly, I think there's increasing international recognition of the challenges that these uh, coastal communities are facing. A again, last uh, September in the UN, 112 countries signed up to a call for action on climate resilience. And that's a call for action which is underpinned by some kind of concrete steps, including a risk-informed early action plan and also a private sector-led coalition for climate resilient investment. And the UK is also very proud to support um, those, those initiatives. Thank you, Dr. Huck. Optimistic or pessimistic? Thank you very much, and let me also uh, thank the organizers for inviting me here. So my um, take on optimism and pessimism is a personal journey. Uh, I started uh, more than two decades ago working on the impacts of climate change, particularly in low-lying countries like Bangladesh, and did some of the early studies uh, that uh, predicted that the impacts of climate change, particularly sea level rise, are going to be dire, which made me a pessimist. So two decades ago, I was a pessimist. Um, I then started working on how do we adapt to those impacts of climate change. And now that's what I do. And how do we build resilience? And I have now transformed myself into an optimist because I do think that we have the ability to um, overcome the challenges. The challenges are great. They're going to be very, very big. But they're not insurmountable and we can do. And the this, this cyclone bulbul that you cited is a very, very good example. You know, we evacuated two million people in Bangladesh. The death toll is very, very small compared to what it otherwise would have been, and it has been in the past from similar types of cyclones. Um, and the other element I would also like to highlight in the case of uh, Bulbul's impacts, particularly in Bangladesh, it would have been orders of magnitude more on the people in the uh, southwestern part of Bangladesh had the Shundarbans not taken the brunt of the impact as it entered Bangladesh. The Shundarban, really the forest, has been our biggest protection. And, and so we need to do a lot more about preserving and conserving the Shundarban forest as well. Excellent, thank you. Can I ask, um, so for this region, what do you see kind of the key risks and impacts being? And you, you said that you're an optimist now, having kind of surveyed that and looked at the responses. Are there any risks out there that we're underplaying, that we're not talking about, or curveballs coming? Or do you think that we know, what, as, be as best as we can, what the impacts are going to be and we need to prepare for them? Well, unfortunately, um, you know, we can't know anything for certain. We always have scenarios. And in fact, there's been a very recent updating of the science on sea level rise, which unfortunately showed that our previous predictions were actually very underestimated. So, uh, the, the extent of sea level rise and the speed with which it's going to happen is actually more than we had anticipated, which for the low-lying coastal areas of Bangladesh and, and this region in the Bay of Bengal means additional potential climate migrants who are going to have to leave the coastal area. We used to estimate in, the, in Bangladesh's case about 10 million over the next two decades. That is probably going to double now. And, and you know, even though it is a frighteningly big figure, Again, I am optimistic that if we know what it's likely to be and take precautions and, and steps to enable these people to, on the one hand, adapt to the conditions where they are, but more importantly, given the time frame, in, enhance the capacities of their children, the girls and boys, to get employment in towns and move when they can uh, uh, you know, not have to live where they are and not become fishers and farmers like their parents, mm -hmm. but get jobs in towns. The other associated issue in Bangladesh is that most people will come to Dhaka. Mm. We don't want that to happen. And so we need to get them to go to other places, which means we have to invest in other towns. So one of the big programs that we are promoting here is what we call climate resilient migrant friendly towns. We've identified a couple of dozen of s smaller towns which can absorb over time maybe half a million to a million migrants coming there, creating the jobs and conditions for them to go there willingly, not force them to go there. And, and therefore take care of these potential climate migrants of the future that we can actually predict are going to happen, but we can prepare for that. Interesting, thank you very much. Uh, and Professor Roy, optimism or pessimism from Miami? So let me start with uh, 
before coming to this panel, I looked up the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change latest report. And um, the IPCC report identifies three drive key drivers to coastal communities, which include sea level rise, ocean temperatures, and ocean acidity. Uh, sitting here in Bangladesh and coming from Miami, these are two areas which are at the forefront of sea level rise. And talking about sea level rise, we talk about global mean sea level rise, which you were talking, uh, Professor Huck was talking about, that those have been grossly underestimated. We also need to talk about relative sea level rise, which relates to subsidence. So Dhaka is one of the cities which is also facing the impacts of local subsidence. So it's just not only sea levels rising, but the cities, sinking cities, which is again becoming a key factor. Uh, as far as the question of optimism versus pessimism goes, uh, I believe every difficult opportunity gives rise to opportunities. And this is our opportunity to think about how we can address, how we can become more resilient and adapt to the changing conditions. And I'm happy to talk about it more. Can I have a, an immediate follow-up then? Yes. So you're currently based in Miami. That's how I looked up Miami. Thank you, Wikipedia. Uh, two meters mean elevation above sea level, which is less than, less than Dhaka. You've got the Everglades on one side and the sea on the other. How is that city uh, responding to the threat of rising sea levels? And are there any lessons from that Floridian experience for this region, or is it too different? Um, there are similarities and there are dissimilarities. So um, let's talk about Miami. Uh, Miami is uh, located on the southeast peninsula of Florida, the Florida Peninsula. And uh, it consists of uh, the three main counties which consist of the Miami metropolitan region. So Miami uh, competed for the 100 Resilient Cities Rockefeller Foundation and was selected as one of the cities uh, for the 100 Resilient Cities program. As a result of which, each of these counties, which can be considered as, as districts at Bangladesh level, um, has their own uh, offices of resilience. So we have resilience officers. And then all the cities themselves also have their resilience officers. And these resilience officers, they are actively uh, working with the communities and the academic institutions to create awareness about climate change. Not only that, city of Miami Beach, which is, um, I, I consider it like a sandbar, it's a small island off the mainland of uh, Florida. Uh, some of the measures they are taking include stormwater drainage. Uh, so because we have sunny day flooding, which uh, is a big major problem, it's sunny day and the streets start flooding when there's a tide, high tide. Uh, they are constructing sea walls. They have constructed sea walls. Most of the condominium associations, they are building their own pr private sea walls as well as the island itself is building sea walls. Um, there are um, uh, beach erosion control, there are mangroves being planted, artificial dunes. Um, all of these are the different measures that the cities are taking to uh, build resilience measures against uh, climate change. Uh, one of the negative impacts is climate gentrification, which is happening. Uh, it's becoming more and more an issue in Miami where um, areas which were not considered to be good areas in Miami uh, are now the property prices are rising so much because they are the highest point in the city of Miami. So property prices are rising in the areas which are slightly higher in elevation. So <laughs> yeah, real estate hawks are coming up and these high rise buildings, yes. yes. So, so houses, suddenly the beachside condo is not very attractive, but the hillside house is. Yeah, so it's, it's amazing house which was $180,000 five years back is now half a million dollars. And you wonder why all of a sudden. And in, it sounds like in Miami you have a mixture of different actors who are investing in these resilience activities, public, private, city, state, local. I just wondered, is, is that the case? Who, who's paying for all of this? So and is, is it contested in Miami, any of this? So uh, the, there is a, sometimes a balance to be found between development and resilience, for example, if you're putting in a mangrove forest. It, is that a live discourse in that part of the world? So let's talk about the, those who are investing in the resilience measures. So the city is investing, of course. The government, local government is highly invested into building resilience measures. But also private uh, organizations, like just condominium associations, they are building their own sea walls. They are not waiting for the city to come and build a wall for them. The other side of that is uh, a recently city of Miami Beach, they started raising the levels of the pavements 
so that um, there's not so much flooding. But then the local residents started complaining because if you raise the pavement, then the houses also have to be raised. And if the houses are not raised, then the water will all collect in the houses. So they had to stop that activity. So talk about contested uh, mm -hmm. measurements. Winners and losers. Um, if I can go back to JM uh, at, the end of, at the end of the line. Um, so we've heard about kind of rising sea levels. We've heard the potential of kind of climate migration being greater. If, if Prime Minister Modi was to ring you up uh, and ask for your advice on uh, you know, what India's approach to building uh, resilience and addressing those challenges would be, what would your key points be? And also, what, what can the rest of the region and the world learn from India's experience on, on these matters? Two questions. Okay. Uh, first, I'll uh, address what I was thinking from yesterday morning. Uh, is Indo-Pacific a strategic construct? Is it an economic construct? Is it a political construct? To my mind, and strictly from meteorological and climate change perspective, Indo-Pacific area, right from uh, China up to East Africa, is connected because it is impacted by monsoons, summer monsoon, winter monsoon. And what has been found uh, in recent years it's El Nino or La Nina phenomena of Eastern Pacific and the Indian Dipole. The Indian Dipole is situated somewhere between Australia and uh, Indonesia. These two phenomena where the sea level temperature rises or it falls control the monsoon. And what controls the monsoon? Controls the sea surges because if the mon monsoon intensity is more or less, the sea level surges more or less. It also controls what is called the third pole, Himalayas, because the glaciers and the snowfall in Himalayas is controlled by monsoons. And if you remember the geography, at least seven major rivers, starting from Indus and going up to the Yellow River, originate from the Tibetan Plateau. So, I mean, like they say that carbon dioxide is the control knob for uh, 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 global warming. The Indo-Pacific area, it is the temperatures of Pacific and Indian Ocean, which are the control knobs. So to my mind, first thing I'll tell uh, President, uh, Prime Minister Modi is that this conference which ORF and uh, BIS has held in Dhaka on Indo-Pacific, it is a natural construct. It has been driven by the science. Second thing which I'll tell him is, and uh, President Modi, uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi is also already working on it, is that the IPCC models are global models. These are global circulation models. They tell you globally what's happening. Now, it's very good to know average, but average doesn't tell you the regional picture. Regional picture is what is required by the policy makers, by the rulers, by the people, by the stakeholders. What's going to happen in Bangladesh or what's going to happen in Chittagong? what's going to happen in uh, what they used to call uh, Indian subcontinent, what's going to happen in China. Now, these are the areas which require the local picture, but it also requires the boundary conditions, what's happening in the other surrounding regions. And because of the scientific reason, uh, reasons which I have said, Indo-Pacific area is a, you can say, mega region. And in that, you heard in the last session, uh, the number of countries, GDP, trade, and all those kind of things. The human uh, uh, beings' interests are there. So for regional research, for knowing what's going to happen in the region next 10 years, next 20 years, next 30 years, we require regional cooperation. We require more intense data. You'll be surprised if you look at the temperature uh, stations. Uh, it, they're very dense. They're very dense in the US, they're very dense in the Europe. But like in Bangladesh, I don't think there are more than half a dozen or a dozen temperature stations. Why should there not be hundreds of these stations? The same density as in the developed countries doesn't cost lots of money. So we require coordination, we require cooperation, which is already envisaged in the framework convention for climate change. And that's the first thing to do. And once that happens, once we establish confidence in each other, 
then we can think of learning from each other. Bangladesh, for example, I was thinking of some totally different example. Childhood diarrhea used to kill many children. It was in Bangladesh, uh, if, uh, pardon me, not in the Royal uh, Institute for Tropical uh, Diseases. It was found that add a pinch of salt, add a pinch of sugar in a glass of water and give it to the child and he will not die of dysentery or diarrhea. So why can't the local experiences being shared? I mean, uh, I mean I'm from Maharashtra. We have some experiences of our own on disaster management. Bangladesh has it. Tsunami was one of, that's my last point. Tsunami was the last, I mean, one of the most successful thing, 2004, 26 December tsunami. After that, in last 13 years, the countries from Japan up to Africa have collaborated. And this time, tsunami is not going to hit us uh, unawares. So that's my advice to President, uh, not President, Prime Minister Modi, that we need to cooperate, we need to collaborate, and we need to break down the suspicion barrier, barriers between each other. Thank you. Can I um, throw one of your points to Dr. Huck, and that's on the kind of the data and the granularity and the kind of regional and local modeling. Uh, is that good enough? Is it getting better? What's the, what's the future of that? It's certainly not good enough, but it is getting better. As uh, uh, Dr. Moskar pointed out, Bangladesh is so tiny that we only have three or four grid mo points in a global model. Uh, if that, and we need at least a few hundred to be able to model uh, the uh, weather patterns and climate within the country itself, which is quite variable. So we hope that's going to get better. We are putting in place uh, both the government and uh, with uh, particular donors as well, and, and getting better at the downscaling of the models themselves, because what we spoke about earlier were the IPCC global models, which are very, very useful at the global scale, but very not useful at the local scale. Mm -hmm. And particularly for the South Asia region, they're not useful because we have both the monsoon on the one hand and the Himalayas on the other. So the, these two um, structures make it very difficult to scale down from a global to a local unless you have very, very good topographic information at the local level, which we are now having. So the, local, the, the most recent downscale models are much, much better. And uh, we are able to share information much more efficiently. Uh, the example that you gave us earlier of Bulbul, we tracked it all the way down. We knew it was coming. But a very interesting fact about Bulbul, which Dr. Moskar also pointed out, is, is it actually uh, gives us a framing for the Indo-Pacific region because Bulbul didn't originate in the Indian Ocean. It originated in the Pacific as Hurricane Matmo, Typhoon Matmo, and it transports itself across Southeast Asia into the Indian Ocean and became Bulbul when it came and hit us. And that shows you the transconnection between the Pacific and the Indian Ocean mm -hmm. on things of this scale, particularly the El Nino and the La Nina that was talked about. So the region is not just South Asia anymore. It is South Asia and the Pacific as well, okay. meteorologically speaking. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Natalie, if I can skip back to you. So you're from the UK. Um, uh, what role can or should international partners like the UK play in supporting resilience and prosperity in coastal communities? I, I think there's three different areas in which international partners can collaborate um, to support coastal communities uh, around the world. As you mentioned at the start, the UK also has, a, has coastal communities. Uh, and I think those three areas are um, adaptation, um, mitigation, and um, financing too. Um, when it comes to adaptation, uh, um, the UK is working with partners, in, including in Bangladesh and, uh, and, and, and India, on, on, many, on, on many kind of individual projects. Um, but as I said before, I think that the potentially game-changing initiative could be, could be bringing together some of the, those uh, kind of sharings of knowledge and experience in a, in a kind of broader international context. And I think the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure is a really exciting initiative in that in that respect. Um, but secondly, it comes to mitigation, i.e. E. keeping down the global temperature rise um, as much as possible, reducing our emissions, that, that's incredibly important and that's somewhere where clearly the UK recognises that we have a really important role to play. Um, we've, we've reduced our own emissions by 42% since um, 1990, which is the, the fastest progress in the G7, but we recognise that we have to go much further and we've, uh, we, that, which is why we've committed to 
uh, going to net zero emissions um, by 2050 and have legislated to, to do that. Um, and we recognize that, mean, that mean, it means making difficult choices, um, but we're, we're, we're kind of comfortable with, with that. Um, but, uh, but clearly other countries also, also uh, other major economies also need to, need to take action. Um, when it, uh, and thir thirdly, I think the third important thing is, is the issue of finance, um, where, where kind of financial flows both between governments but also from the private sector play a very important role. Again, when it comes to uh, international climate finance, uh, the, the UK is now the largest donor to the um, Global Climate Fund. Um, and, we're all, and we've also announced a doubling in our international climate finance to, 11, uh, to over 11 billion pounds. Um, but we, we shouldn't forget the role of the private sector in this. It's really important that the private sector globally is able to correctly price climate risk and channel investments uh, in, into both climate resilient infrastructure and renewable energy projects around the world and I think again that's where the coalition private sector led coalition for climate resilient um, investment could be could be really important thank you uh, Natalie um, can I ask uh, I think I might ask this again a, a similar question to all the panels so if we think about this region uh, if we think about coordination and governance and in institutions uh, is there a gap uh, in South Asia in, in the Indo-Pacific in terms of helping kind of vulnerable coastal communities? Do you think, is, is, is there room for a new institution or new partnerships or new coordination mechanisms? Can I ask you first, Professor? So I was looking up uh, some of the me measures which have been taken in this particular region, specifically Bangladesh. Um, actually, uh, so some of the, the threats from climate change, specifically in Bangladesh coastal communities include uh, increased salinity, flooding, inundation. Um, uh, those are the two main fact, the two main uh, impacts of sea level rise that can happen. And um, I, I found out that there have been quite a few measures, community-based approaches, which have been adopted in uh, Bangladesh specifically. So, for instance, there have been uh, serine resistant cropping, uh, mangrove fruit production to develop local female entrepreneurship. Uh, in order to uh, combat flooding uh, inundation, there have been uh, cultivating vegetables and crops on floating gardens. Uh, there have been curriculum development for uh, climate change on climate change from the school and uh, from the lower levels from schools to university. Um, we were just talking before the, the this, this panel session in the green room about the early warning system, which has been adopted at the much local level. So they have been adopted at the local level, local languages. So uh, there have been a lot of measures that have been taking place, have been taking place in different parts of the community. Um, maybe there's not much so much awareness, but better coordination could lead to uh, a better implementation of those strat strategies. Can I ask you that question, Dr. Hart? Sure. So just to build on what Professor Sen has just said, um, I wouldn't say that everything is perfect. There's always a room for improvement. But I'm not sure that we need new institutions. I think there's quite a lot of cooperation. We have a, among civil society, we have a climate action network in South Asia, very, very active, hundreds of NGOs across the region working together. In the academic sector, which I represent, we have a platform of more than 50 universities in Bangladesh called Gobeshana, which is a Bangla word for research. And we are networked with universities in the region as well uh, on the research and findings and sharing the knowledge that is being generated. So I think, uh, and within the MET departments as well, the different MET departments are also working together on the, on the downscale models that I mentioned for the South Asia region. It, the, the region is the same, the modeling uh, the, the downscale model from the global model is for the region and then the further downscaling at the national level is a national bit, but the, you have to connect them all and they are being connected now. Um, where I'd say that there is an opportunity for us to do more is to connect these dots. They're, they're happening on their own, but they're happening in parallel. And I think where we have an opportunity from a forum like this with the governments being involved and taking a much bigger uh, transnational cooperation attitude to combating climate change, which is a global problem after all. It's manifested at the national and local level, but it's a global phenomenon. And so it, there's an opportunity for us to work within the region and at the global level as well, which perhaps we haven't done as much as we could do. Natalie. 
Thanks. Uh, just to say, over the last few days, it's been really exciting for me to find out more about the really uh, the, the things which are happening at, at the regional level, um, uh, as, as, you, as you've just described on, on this subject. But I agree that there is a, a role at the global level too. And um, it, in the UK, we're, we're proud to have been nominated as the hosts of the um, UN Conference of Parties conference uh, uh, next next year. It'll be five years after the. Uh, after the Paris uh, Paris Agreement, it will be those those UN negotiations. Um, we're we're really excited about that. Um, F everyone from around the world will be coming to Glasgow um, that December to talk about how we can bring a uh, jumper. Yeah, how 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 we, how we can get together to uh, tackle these issues of adaptation, um, mitigation, and uh, finance uh, as as well. And I think um, as as hosts of that process, the UK will be really keen to make sure that we are uh, over, over, the, over the year showing, uh, showing to the world not only the, the challenges which this region is facing, but really showcasing the, the excellent work which is already being done um, in adaptation and mitigation. Thank you. JM, any thoughts on this question? Uh, I'll slightly go off on a tangent, if you permit me. See that uh, war analogy which I gave was a bit, bit tongue-in-cheek because we have been reading about climate emergency and what all we must do. But uh, what's not coming, the deeds are not commensurate with the words. Global Climate Change Fund, we talked of $100 billion flow per year by the year 2020. Uh, Global Climate Change Fund, GCF, has less than $10 billion in the kitty. Uh, people will say, yeah, private sector plus public sector plus government fund should be $100 billion. But if you count that also, if you count it properly, it's nowhere near reaching the target of $100 billion. So money makes the world go. And I, I think, I mean, if we are looking at it, I mean, I was in government, but now I'm a private citizen. The fund flow is something which tells you how real the emergency is. But if the fund flow is enough, then all the innovations, discoveries, everything come. So it, money is the real crux. Second is, when I looked at the booklet, and all of you must have looked at it, I counted the word equi equitable. Equitable word occurred at least half a dozen times. And that cheered me to no end. Because whether it is relationship between one another as human beings, whether it is a relationship between the countries, or whether it is a relationship between ourselves and the generation yet to be born, what is called as intergeneration equity. Equity is the key for climate actions because climate change is an externality. It's going to happen. The carbon dioxide which is in the air, the momentum is there, it's going to happen. And unless we anchor our actions, our thoughts in equity, we may land up in a state which is worse than today. Can I ask you a follow-up on that, GM? So do you think the blockage there is political will, or do you think it's more technical? Uh, and do you think it's shifting positively uh, at all? It depends on the time of the day and how tired I am when I think of these <laughs> when the tricky problems. As I said, you know, the rhetoric and the deeds are not matching. No, it could be because uh, you know, there is a level, there is an inertia also. The rhetoric of today and the deeds of the government, there is a bit of inertia or lag, mm. lag back. So in optimistic mood, I think the lag is due to uh, this kind of thing that rhetoric and the actions are different. Sometimes when I'm pessimistic, I'm not really sure. But then the optimistic uh, uh, angle here is, at least for South Asia, we have something called natural variability of climate. And that right from the Mauryan days, that is how to com combat famine, the king had to store grain for one full year. King had to see that the water resources are protected. Now those kind of king craft has been there for last 5,000 years. So if you are tackling natural variability right, the adaptation part at least for next 10 years, 15 years, we are through. But what happens after 15 years? And that is where these tricky issues of climate finance, the tricky issue of uh, uh, equity, 
equity between the countries, equity between the generations, equity between the present generation, the inequitable growth which all of us are worried about, those issues come. So for next year, 10 years, if you go in the proper direction with proper principles, then I'm sure future gen decades will follow. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we've got 15 minutes or so left. So I would like to open the floor to questions. Uh, if anyone's got one, there's someone at the back there, and I think then we've got some people here as well. Let's start over there. I'll take a round and then put them to the to put them to the panel. Please tell us who you are. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Umran Chaudhry. I I work in the legal sector, and I'm also a columnist in the Dhaka Tribune. Uh, my question is, uh, should Bangladesh consider mega projects like uh, the system of locks you have in the Netherlands in the coastal areas? Uh, a very large part of the Netherlands uh, is below sea level. And would uh, mega projects such as locks be feasible in combating climate change? Thank you. Thank you very much. Who would like to go next? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Mohammad Ashraf Ali. I'm a, uh, an undergraduate student of the Department of International Relations at University of Dhaka. My question is to the panel that uh, they are talking about uh, for funding, uh, 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 providing funding and arranging funding for mitigations and other mechanisms so that we can adopt and prevent the uh, uh, casualties uh, of uh, uh, like environmental uh, problem and for uh, to, to uh, prevent or challenge, to make the challenge of this problem. But I would like to say that uh, uh, some of these speakers have missed the idea of environmental justice that we need to address in this area because most of the people living in coastal areas are so much vulnerable and uh, making funding and the uh, mechanisms for uh, adaptations uh, make likely to make uh, no sense or little sense to them. Uh, it uh, would be better to make or ensure the environmental justice so that the culpators uh, who are producing uh, the carbon dioxide and uh, emitting carbon dioxide uh, should be punished and should take strict laws so that uh, it, uh, it reduces the number of the vulnerability of this coastal area. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. My name is Mahfuz Kubir. I'm from BIS. Uh, basically, I mean, the, we are all talking about the sea level rise and salinity, but the, I think the most danger which is forthcoming is, is uh, ocean acidification, I mean, the pH level of the water across the, in fact, world. So what are we going to do to th this? Because, I mean, the, in the climate change and other uh, issues, uh, I think that these issues will be a big, big challenge for, for and, and also, if we think about the global models like, I mean, the GCM, the Global Circulation Model, and, and others like, I mean, uh, the, uh, the Integrated uh, Assessment Model, so it dies and rise, and, and also the, uh, the uh, in fact, stern review. So if we consider all this, whether these models are going to include this particular issue of, of acidification, because it's going to be a big, big harm for the, especially for the coastal communities in, in the question of resilience. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, madam. I'm Shagufta Bushramishma, uh, General Secretary of Dhaka um, University's Hall, uh, Bangladesh Kuwait Muitri Hall Parliament, and the debater of DUDS. I have two questions. Uh, first one is, as we all know that uh, the working of Rampal power plant is going on, how it is possible to preserve Sundarban from the physical chemical condition of this project? And the second one is, while we, uh, while we give a look on Rohingya issue, we can see that they have destroyed almost 6,000 acres of land to get settled. So how the loss can be recovered as it is very much closely re related to the climate change? Thank you. Yeah, hello. Any more? Yeah, here. Yeah. Yes, yeah, madam. my name is Neha Kumar, and I work with Climate Bonds Initiative India Program. And I wanted to take on the point where Natalie left off from uh, in terms of mobilizing private capital. Uh, just wanted to inform the House, it's more than a question, it's actually information and suggestion, that we were recently involved in a study which was commissioned by Bangladesh Bank on actually looking at the potential of green bonds 
into uh, for mobilizing private capital. Now, we do know that the, the domestic capital market is pretty uh, nascent in stage. Uh, but Bangladesh Bank is taking very, very progressive steps. Um, it has, it is looking at, I mean, we have recommended, and it is the, the, the studies in public domain, but I'll just take one minute to say the main recommendations. One is to create a green project pipeline. Right now, it is limited to energy sector. And I think today, we, when we're talking of resilience, when the government actually issues probably a sovereign bond, uh, a state-backed institution, or a development finance institution does this for Bangladesh or in, in form of a cornerstone investment, I think it will really be able to bring the resilience aspect and link it to the capital market access for resilient investment. EBRD has recently issued a 700 million USD uh, bond for climate resilience. And it is following the principle which have recently been issued by Climate Bonds Initiative. These are called climate resilience principles. So there is now uh, leading examples of private investment flowing into resilience infrastructure. And I think they'll be very, very relevant for Bangladesh. Bangladesh is already taking the first steps that are required. More needs to be done and deeper conversations can be had. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to immediately throw that to Natalie as a question then. <laughs> Oh, is there one more? Sorry, yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Getacho from uh, Ethiopia. Uh, I have one question. Uh, you know, in, in this uh, global uh, uh, management of these environmental problems, uh, scholars say that in addition to mitigation and adaptation, there should be this solar uh, emission management system or solar radiation management, which is a new concept uh, used by different scholars to, to handle the problems of environment or climate change, uh, which needs a huge infrastructure, money and capital and expertise. Uh, so I would like to see your comments on this new development throughout the world. Thank you very much indeed. Sorry, can you just say what it was again? Sorry, sir, can you? Sorry, I missed it. Solar emission management, was it? Solar radiation management. Solar radiation management. Radiation management, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so Natalie, I was going to go back to the finance question. So I think we have an example there of uh, leveraging private capital into green and resilient infrastructure. How do you get more of it, uh, and what's stopping it? Uh, it's fantastic to hear that the Bank of Bangladesh is uh, looking at this source of uh, funding, and I'm sure you know, the London Stock Exchange would be happy to talk to them about that. Um, there's now more than 96 green bonds issued on the LSE, and I think uh, um, there have been Indian green bonds uh, worth about $1.5 billion already, and I think hopefully uh, more, in the, more in the pipeline, so that's, uh, that's great. I mean, in the... Um, it, in London, there's now a pool of hard-nosed investors who only want to invest in green, and they want to invest in green um, because that's what their investors are telling them to invest in, and they want to take into account climate risk because they recognise that as a huge risk to the to the financial system. So there's a there's a there is a huge um, huge and very interested um, market there. Um, um, it's obviously lots of lots of technicalities that have to be discussed in the in the issuance of any of these. Um, bonds and important that we collaborate internationally um, to agree things like kind of consistent disclosure arrangements, etc. But um, fantastic news that the Bank of Bangladesh would be uh, interested. Professor Roy, can I ask you ocean acidification? I was thinking uh, that would come to me. <laughs> <laughs> As the climatologist, what is it uh, uh, for the uninitiated uh, and should we be worried about it and are the models capturing it? We should be definitely worried about ocean acidification. Um, so one of the impacts of ocean acidification is in the form of coral bleaching, which is a major problem uh, off the coast of Florida, Bangladesh, in the tropics, that's where the corals are located. So coral bleaching is one of the major impacts of uh, ocean acidification. Other than that, there's also eutrophication, uh, which also, so for instance, we have been seeing a lot of um, uh, red tide and uh, blue tide off the coast of Florida. So these algae which are growing because of all the fertilizer 
fr uh, runoff from the agricultural areas into the ocean, which is leading to um, uptick in the levels of chemicals and coastal upwellings. How does this impact? Uh, it impacts the marine ecosystem, not only the corals, but also the marine ecosystem in the form of fish and other sea, sea life, uh, which ultimately gets into the human system through the seafood we get. So those are some of the impacts which ocean acidification will have and we should be concerned about. Okay. So. Um, Dr. Huck, can I ask you this? Two questions. One was about whether Bangladesh should consider kind of more mega projects or the likes uh, similar to the, to the Netherlands and lock systems of locks. Uh, and then the other one was uh, about a mega project here, which is caught, clearly causing some concern locally in Bangladesh, particularly for its imp impact on the Sundarbans. More mega projects, if so, which ones? Mm -hmm. And then how do you deal with the fact that they will have consequences perhaps for the natural environment in, them, in themselves? Thank you very much. Um, thank you for those questions as well. So my view on this is, firstly, the comparison between the Netherlands and Bangladesh is not a particularly useful one because they have the, first of all, they're a lot smaller than us. The rivers that they have to tame and work with are much smaller than ours. Ours are orders of magnitude bigger. And they have the wherewithal to be able to build dikes to protect the entire population behind seawalls, which we cannot do. So the Netherlands example in terms of physical infrastructure is not something we can emulate, except for very small parts of our coast. On the other hand, the Netherlands knowledge, experience, modeling capabilities is something that we should certainly want to share their knowledge on in order for us to develop ourselves. On the specifics of the Shundarbans, I mentioned earlier how important it was in just in the last 48 hours preventing many, many more deaths that would have happened in Bangladesh. It is an extremely important part of our economy, even if it's a, a natural system, and it's the biggest mangrove forest in the world and a world heritage site which we have responsibility for preserving. One of the things we need to be thinking about is how do we build our infrastructure, which we need, I'm not saying we don't need it, but we need to make it on what is now termed nature-based solutions, on green development rather than the previously polluting, destroying nature development that unfortunately we have done. Our economic development has been good on the one hand in terms of economic uh, uh, you know, development and, and uh, growth, but it has been very bad in terms of preserving and conserving our en environment. It has been at the cost of our environment and we cannot let that continue to happen. And the final point I make in that context is that we are now at a very, very critical point in time when we are building a bridge from Dhaka to take us down to the southwestern part of the country to Kulna, connect Kulna with Bangladesh, with, uh, with Dhaka, with the Padma Bridge. Once the bridge is constructed, we will see a lot of development in the Kulna region, which is a good thing. But if we see the bad kind of development that's going to destroy the Shundarbans, that is a bad thing. And we need to be planning good development versus bad development now. If we don't put the structures in place, the regulations, the policies, and more importantly, implement them, then we will end up destroying the Shundarbans. And I'm very, very scared about that. Thank you. Thank you. And JM, can the, the final question, which is about kind of climate justice and how do you ensure that the most vulnerable communities are receiving the assistance and funding they need? Do you need to punish the worst offenders when it comes to uh, CO2 emissions? Uh, Tricky one to end on, I know. You see this environment justice, climate justice, when you talk of justice, there has to be an agreed law. Justice, first you have a law, what has to be done or what is prohibited, and then you have punishment, that what happens if you don't do what you're supposed to do, or if you do what you are not supposed to do. Now, the climate justice or environment justice which is being thought, uh, which, which is being talked of, are still talks. They are not there in form of treaties, they are not in form of laws, whether international or domestic. But what we have, a treaty is a kind of international binding law. We have the Framework Convention on Climate Change. We have the Paris Agreement, which is an instrument under the uh, climate change convention and we are not thinking of implementing it we are not thinking of naming and shaming it for those parties which are not adhering to the treaties which they have already ratified so the question is practical uh, the bird in hand is worth two in the bush 
So yes, we need to talk of climate justice. We need to talk, I was thinking yesterday night, that you know, India and Bangladesh sorted out their maritime problems by following the International Treaty of UNCLOS, uh, UN Convention of Laws of Seas. We still are uh, I mean, having difference of opinion about the rivers because there's no UN Convention on how the river water is to be shared. I wish there was, but it was not. When Pakistan, the then Pakistan signed Interwaters, Indus Water Treaty with India under aegis of World Bank, I wish they had thought of Brahmaputra and Ganges as well, and lots of hard burn on either side of the fence would have been sorted out. But then, uh, I mean, the Pakistan didn't take the lead. World Bank had too many things on their plate. So similarly, now if India and Bangladesh want to sort out their water problem, or if India and China were to do it, there is no UN treaty, there is no law to tell them how it is to be done. So while we need to talk about climate justice, we need to convince each other. But uh, what I wonder is, why we are talking of climate justice and why we are not talking of equity and why we are not talking of CBDR, which is already agreed. I mean, President Trump, yesterday somebody mentioned he has opted out of Paris Agreement, but the US has not opted out of the Framework Convention on Climate Change which I think is a very positive development. I mean, there are two sides of each coin. So US has not gone out of the Climate Change Convention, and they are bound as any other country, Bangladesh, India, China, uh, Russia, uh, to the Framework Convention and Conception of Equity and CBDR. Why are we not talking or working on it? And I want to say one more thing about geoengineering. Geoengineering is, I mean, even more vague or it is more dangerous or a more difficult thing than uh, climate change adaptation or mitigation. We know what is climate change adaptation, we know what is climate change mitigation, financing and so on and so forth. Geoengineering is that you throw lots of sulfates in the air mm -hmm. and dim the sun. But do you know the modeling shows that you do that there will be 20 percent or 30 percent change in the monsoons, reduction in monsoons. Now, uh, Professor Sain Roy was telling that her father was a director general of IMD. Now, Indian monsoon, since the historical uh, records existed, that is 1750 onwards, when there was a meteorological department under East India Company, Indian monsoons have not deviated plus minus 10%, either 90% of the average or 110% of average. If Indian monsoon suddenly became 70% of the average, even Bangladesh will be like Rajasthan. So why do we want to go that way of uh, large unknown unknowns, not even known unknowns, unknown unknowns. So let's talk about, let's keep on talking about climate justice, let's talk of geoengineering, but let's not go on that path. First, let's go on the path which we have already chosen and we are not going on that direction. Thank you very much to all of you. The, the big clock in front of me says zero, and I can see a Tanubi uh, <laughs> gesturing at me. So thank you very much. I think we had four optimists uh, on the panel, uh, and I think, I think we finished this panel in, uh, in a spirit of optimism. I think particularly around the huge progress that's been made in this region on building resilience and when something bad is happening, getting people to the right place and away from it. And I think a, a lot of insights into uh, the hard work that we've got to get on with and also possibly the things that we, we shouldn't pursue. Can I say a big, big thank you to the members of, of my panel? Thank you very much.